Hi, I'm Alex. I am a PhD candidate in Aaron Silva's lab, and um, today I'm going to talk about some of the research I did exploring um, Wisconsin organic vegetable growers' needs and experiences with seeds, so digging a little bit um, into deeper detail with the same theme. I think there's a recognition that we, that uh, especially among people here in this room, about the importance of well-adapted varieties for organic agriculture, but even with these great surveys, when we really delve into how do we how do we address these needs, we're confronted by this problem of identifying farmer priorities. And I started my PhD working with a team of researchers on the Northern Organic Vegetable Improvement Collaborative, which is um, an initiative which OSA and Wisconsin, as well as other universities, are a part of to do participatory variety trials on organic farms. And in Wisconsin, we wanted to um, get a better sense of what some of our growers needs and so the, the Wisconsin team did a, did a survey in 2012, the Wisconsin Organic uh, Seed and Plant Breeding Survey and um, results from that survey have been published. I didn't get it into the slide but they'll be published soon in the um, in Agroecology and Sustainable Food Systems and I have a reference for that paper. You can make them available on the Novik website? Yes, yeah, and I actually have a copy with me today. Um, but one of our takeaway messages from that survey was that Wisconsin vegetable growers' needs are very diverse. And when we asked them about the crops that were most important to them in terms of economic value on their farm and in terms of their plant breeding priorities, we had a very wide range of crops, including write-ins, where one farmer had one crop that was most important to them that no other farmer shared. And we had a lot of ties among the crops that were most popular. So we wanted to do some qualitative work to dig deeper into this and understand some of the background context. So from um, 2012 through 2013, I conducted interviews with farmers from Wisconsin, uh, 15 farms in Wisconsin and Minnesota. And these were farmers I'd met through our research networks and through snowball sampling, which is when you ask your respondents for other people that you should talk to. I looked especially for farmers who were particularly interested or involved in seed issues and tried to select them from a wide range of farms. So our largest one grew over 100 acres in vegetable production. Our smallest one was under an acre of vegetable production. And then my analysis of these interviews followed grounded theory, which is a very widely used methodology in the social sciences. You take your interviews, you attach um, sort of thematic codes to them, you use these codes, they're usually you know, a word or two long meanings and sort them into categories and then you use those to return back to your interviews and perhaps do more interviews to test the emerging theory and eventually arrive at your conclusions. And today I want to talk about a few themes that arose from these interviews that, I, that are particularly relevant for our topic today and that was the idea of workhorse varieties. Some farmers called them tried and trues and um, why they're so important on organic farms, what kind of vulnerabilities farmers uh, experience in relation to these varieties and how they're responding, and what we can learn from this in the organic seed movement. So I'll start that first question. Uh, what do I mean by workhorse varieties? They're stable across environments, and they're well buffered. Um, they're high yielding, but reliably so. So a combination of stability and high yield. And importantly, they're proven through farmers' experience growing them on their own farms. So we have a picture here of uh, one of the participants in the Novik trials like to do a very early direct seeding of sweet corn. He was using raised beds to try to buffer the crop from some of those early season challenges, but definitely needing genetics as well to do that buffering. I have quotes sprinkled through here that are, I, I pulled out because I think they're representative of what a lot of farmers were saying, and I'll skim them a bit. Um, but a workforce variety is a variety that performs well in a whole variety of conditions. We can have a cold, wet spring like last year, or we can have a rather dry and hot and cold spring like we're having this year. Some types of vegetables we expect to do poorer in certain, in certain conditions, but there are some that... Um, that, that uh, perform better in a wide array. Um, and so she said, there are some varieties that we've just honed in on. These are going to be reliable for us regardless of what happens when they're in the field. So why are these varieties so important for organic farmers? Um, to think about this question, we have to go back to our two themes that 
that I saw emerging. One was the kind of variation that, our, that we have on organic farms, and another one was uh, emerging from the survey that we did, the uh, behavior of organic vegetable farmers seeking niches and creative um, specializations in the marketplace, finding crops that worked on their farms, but where they also weren't competing on volume with other farmers. So there's definitely um, seems to be a consensus out there that we have more, orga more variability on organic farms, although as Jared and I were just discussing, sometimes it's hard to actually dig down and find the data that prove that. Um, but there have def definitely been showing, definitely been studies showing um, more variation on organic farms versus conventional farms, likely because organic farmers aren't using the same kind of tools to rapidly control the environment. Um, that variation occurs between farms and within one farm. It can occur within one season and season to season. And then on top of that, we have social and economic variation that's contributing to what's going to work on a particular farm. So part of that social and economic variation is this behavior that we, that we kind of theorized about based on our survey results of farmers... Um, diversity within the organic vegetable sector being driven by this behavior of farmers looking for something new and special that uh, will distinguish their farm and that will work for them. Um, so that's, it's based on market opportunities they find and it's based on what they like to grow and what grows well for them. And these workhorse varieties help them to fulfill the niches that they find and, and create for themselves. So with one farmer that I interviewed, he was completely focused on flavor in herb crops to do processing. Um, some of them were wholesale opportunities for very specific restaurant niches. Um, and then there were some associated with CSA. So this CSA farmer said, we have a really cool spring into a hot June. So for broccoli, we want the earliest possible variety. We plant broccoli in a hoop house. And she said she knows no one else does that. So again, a unique niche. Um, and they try to get it for their, about their fourth box. That's our ideal because there's that lull for CSA. So we're looking for things that maybe coincide with the weather and do well, and do well consistently. For wholesale, I think this, this farmer's quote about wholesale really demonstrates how some of the market forces and competition between growers um, drives this niche-seeking behavior. Staying power was everything. The fact that you could say you were going to grow a crop, deliver it, and have a product with shelf life and hang in there in the market. You could get in that window and stay there until no one else had it. So the varieties then had to have the qualities that would support that. So the, the dependence on workhorse varieties leaves farmers vulnerable when access to those varieties is threatened. And um, I found that farmers were using their social resources, their um, relationships with other growers, relationships with people in the seed industry, relationships with someone that might be uh, helping them order seed to try to suss out what threats to variety access might be coming. Um, they were sometimes even asking me why, they, why a certain variety might or might not be available, especially as organic seed. Um, and when they caught wind of a threat, then they were starting to save seed when they could. Um, they were buying ahead and storing seed, and they were searching for replacements. So this farmer said, we had this melon that we we're in danger of losing, and I tried but failed to grow. It's a hybrid, and I thought maybe we could select out an open, poll open pollinated melon out of it, but I just got weird stuff. Just weird. I lost my patience because it was just, it looked impossible. Um, and he went on to say that the seed company had that offered this variety had stopped offering it in their um, catalog for farmers, but was still offering it in their home gardener catalog. So last year we bought another five year supply. The seed is keeping for us. We're planting seed that's five years old. We also invested several thousand dollars in that pound of seed, but we still have it. Uh, so these are the kind of links that farmers were going to to keep their workhorse varieties. And then another farmer was talking about Brussels sprouts. She said she had a variety called Oliver that worked well for many years, and then it disappeared. Um, and she said she trialed a couple varieties to that were supposed to be replacements. And she said maybe it was just the years, but they were crappy. 
you know, and it would have been nicer if I still had the Oliver to compare him to and go, okay, was it the year or not? But at that point, she didn't have access to that seed anymore. So what can we learn from this, um, thinking about the broader organic seed movement? Um, I think to, to think about this question, we have to go back to some, some basic plant breeding concept. So wide adaptation is a variety that does well over large areas and has high mean yields across environments. And um, specific or local adaptation occurs when varieties, one variety does better in one environment and another variety does better in another environment in relation to each other. And then stability can be a little harder to define, um, but we can think of it as when yields vary uh, very little relatively around, or around an average yield compared, uh, when you, after you control for environments. So when we think about genetic by environment interactions in organic agriculture and, and breeding for organic agriculture, we tend to talk about um, variation in terms of from one farm to another. So one va variety A does better on farm one or region one and variety B does better um, in farm two or region two. Um, but in very large areas like the upper Midwest, um, really what farmers are experiencing is greater variation coming from fluctuations in weather from year to year. And so in this, cons in this kind of situation, they may need a wide adaptation and that seemed to fit more with what farmers were saying as the way they described the varieties they valued most. Um, and this uh, in Atlin et al. have discussed how, um, how this need for wide adaptation in these kind of environments seems to be in conflict with the emphasis that that's often present in participatory plant breeding literature about having local and specific adaptation. So I certainly don't have an answer to this today, but I think that it's a really important thing to think about strategically um, in choosing how to breed for different, for different organic markets and different um, environments. Well, what's at stake for organic seed? Um, clearly from, from my interviews, these workhorse varieties are very important and farmers are quite concerned when they lose access to them. So it's just difficult to maintain access to them. It, that, that needs to be done as much as possible, but perhaps a, another goal connected to that would be when we do develop replacement varieties or varieties that compete with those to um, make sure that we have them in settings that are going to be a more secure access for farmers, whether that's open pollinated varieties or whether those are hybrids that are in the hands of smaller seed companies that are going to be more responsive to organic growers needs. Or large seed companies. Or responsive yes. Needs. Yeah, yeah. Um, recommendations going forward. I think that certainly in Wisconsin among these growers that kind of variety disappearance is a real opportunity for education about the seed industry which is often quite opaque um, especially to the smaller and mid-scale mid -scale growers. Um, Identifying, as, as uh, we were just talking about in the last question section, identifying what those workhorse varieties are that farmers are, are not being able to access, and perhaps even storing some of that seed to be able to use it in variety trials. Um, and then again, thinking, thinking uh, more regionally about wide versus specific adaptation in our breeding programs. Um, I'll, ha I'll say my references just for anybody who wants to look at them later that I wanted to thank all of the organizations and people that have helped me to be here today.